Today I'm going to read from The Edge of the Continent, Volume 3, The Desert. Uh, this is a book, uh, the last in the trilogy. It's all about Joshua Tree and my time spent living out in Joshua Tree. Um, these poems are probably my favorite poems I've ever written. Um, this book and Help in the Dark Season are my favorite things I think I've written. Um, and it's hard for me to choose which poems to read from this book because I kind of want to read them all. So I'm just going to go through it and just keep reading um, maybe for like 30 minutes or so. And then uh, I'll take any questions anybody has after that. And yeah, just sit back and enjoy. I hope it's nice to be read too. Joshua Tree. When fools forget the bounty of the desert and call it dead, your body reminds them of dogged life. Your shaggy limbs reach in every direction as you spread your family throughout the valley. Against the wind, you shudder and bend. You have an uncanny ability to cradle the moon. Your white flowers are cups of air, bells holding thousands of the blackest pupils, seeds that have seen time shift like an ocean. I kneel close and kiss the one white spot on your gnarled trunk. Grandmother with your sturdy hide, your lineage exalts the endless sky. I hope that some people who are uh, tuning into this are the desert lovers of my crew out there. <laughs> desert bear. I know how to heal myself. In solitude, my routine of waking up with the sun, writing and singing, to memorize the names of plants, to walk a familiar gait softly as to not disturb the delicate growth that somehow withstands wind and heat day on end. No one can see me. I take many deep breaths and never hurry. I sleep when I feel like sleeping. What comes out of me in this buoyed state is the voice of the sacred cosmos. I hear it start to build after three days in the desert. Deep, warm sand and cool stone. They say there is an extensive aquifer below this landscape, wetness in the dark. There is a bear who lives in the boulders. She is me. Here she is in her finest season. I always think that's kind of funny poem because there is no bear in the boulders in Joshua Tree, but I was just talking about myself. Watermelon and oranges. In the morning, I eat watermelon and oranges. I'm barefoot, but wearing a thick wool coat. I forget what day it is, what season, what chores call me out into the yard. I give rinds to the chickens, drop seeds for the wood rats, and leave the sweet juice on my mouth as I read a few poems aloud to the snow-covered mountains. My time in Joshua Tree was obviously very magical. Um, orbit in the sand. There's no muddled gray-blue dusk here. The sky just keeps on giving. I find the moon. It's been present all day long, like a small, well-chiseled cloud. I climb the mound of cinder blocks to watch the solid orange curtain sink behind the mountains. Suddenly, I'm running, and when I face west, I can't see anything but desert. When I find the first star, I tiptoe off-road, careful not to crush the brittle brush. I stoop to stare at one plant that creates a circle around itself, its slender branch tracing an orbit in the sand, guided by wind. It takes so long for the whole of darkness to settle. I start singing. I speak to every chaparral. When I return home, it's dark, and you're seated right where I left you when I bolted. The moon is bright in your eyes and I sense a triangle of energy moving between us. You, me, moon. You, me, moon. Any sign of a human being. 
Any sign of a human being in the desert is unwanted. I'm not here to witness us. The discarded garden glove dropped in the sand startles me every time I walk by. I snarl at the tire tracks that tore up the rock field. Old wool blanket, burnt out sedan, rusted box springs, all scars on an otherwise subtle place. The bombs to the northeast, the hiss of cars on a nearby road, and the rattle of chain link, all a distraction from the voice of wind. But the silver set of Toyota keys balanced on the sand hill brings me joy. I like the unknown story there. The footprints that I share the trail with could instill a sense of fear. I'm not alone here. And yet, I wonder who else enjoys this rhythmic trek toward the setting sun. Did they restack the mound of black rock so that I'd notice? I changed the composition a bit to communicate with them in return. I hope we never actually see each other. That would ruin it. I love this little poem. I never read this one out loud, but the smell of creosote when it rains. I saw the buffalo in my mind. I saw the Buddha too. I saw color expand from purple to turquoise blue. I saw Angela adorned with golden fire. I saw 1,000 brown glass bottles open for my heart. I fell into the earth off a high cliff and melted down. I saw the temple inside myself grow. Uh, quiet. Sometimes the bee or the fly sounds like a human voice. I pause to hear how close the man is. Is he angry or laughing, near enough that I can make out his words? No, it's just the humming in the Palo Verde, busy wings catching sun in their iridescent lace. The wind makes voices in the plants. The low-lying bush sings especially loud. The fence groans and makes a knocking. The rafters squeak and reply like an antelope rat. This cold pear is perfectly ripe. Some parts of its flesh are as brown as mine. Today I've seen at least four varieties of ants. There's no one to show them to, and I'm fine with that. If anyone else were here, they'd be speaking, and I wouldn't hear this other quiet language. There's one thing that I really love about all these California books is there's like, I've allowed myself to create this sort of repetitive theme that moves through all three of them and where I kind of circle back on the things that happen in a, in a place that you notice over and over again and they become symbolic, they become important. And I try to tie those into the poems throughout so you can just sort of feel that same feeling that I felt, which is this day on end, this is the thing that keeps coming back to me, or this is the thing that keeps speaking to me or teaching me or showing me something new. Draw who you want. Tonight, I discover that if I draw a creature in the sand, it will appear. I kneel and trace a dragonfly and one flies by. I try the jackrabbit, usually more elusive, and a slender one walks out onto the path ahead of me. It comes closer and circles. I scribble the grasshopper and one the color of white granite lands on my bare knee. I sit before my altar of quartz and hold my breath in belief. Who else do I want to see? I decide not to draw the snake today, not the coyote, but the tortoise, so rare, a test, I suppose. I forget to draw an eye and think that means I'll see a dead one. Walking home, I spot the smallest flare below a creosote, a strange flower in the sand. I bend over and pluck it up only to gasp in awe at the mummified foot of a tortoise, whole, waiting for me as I asked it to be. True story. <laughs> I love every part of that poem, it's true. There's not even like a made up image. Everything is just full truth. <laughs> uh, how are we to know the limit? 
How are we to know the limit when something as astonishing as the fig wasp exists? Or when we ride Mustangs? We cannot know where to end or where to give up. We thought this planet was flat. We thought everything beyond the eye's capability was abyss. See how it continues onward? Understand how we're truly as limitless as the universe? We're just spinning, eyes open, mouths open, awestruck and guessing. Um, I'll circle back to that idea of the, the truth, the full truth. Because a lot of times, I think in poems, the job of the poet is to emphasize the truth with an expanded image to create a wider imaginative vision of something tactile that then illuminates the emotional experience or whatever the, the power of the experience for the reader is then brought into like greater understanding or it's made more accessible because you add this you know, some, some, some sort of special imagery to it that then accentuates it. And that doesn't mean that it's not true. You're just trying to explain it. Um, but then there are some poems like that one I was talking about that are just, that's exactly what it was. I don't even have to really add an image for it to be as potent as the moment was. Um, I'm just going to keep going. The Rule of Rocks. I walk through the desert and rub the smooth backs of every semi-flat stone, a ritual of stroking. I am not allowed to pocket any unless they are fully on the surface. No matter how beautiful, no matter the shade of green or shape of heart, I leave them fixed in sand if they aren't completely poised atop the ground. Rare, wind-polished crystal, strange, flame-like granite, small chips of shining quartz. I kneel and pet, kneel and pet, and hope for a few that wiggle with the obvious signal of a gift. Touching them alone is enough. I remember when I chose to put this poem in the book, I thought, you know, I need to put this in there so people leave the rocks in the desert because <laughs> I had made this rule up for myself. Believe me, I have a lot of rocks, but I was like, there's got to be some rule around this rock taking. Like you can't just pick up anything and take it. There's just this like weird capitalist need in us to own things and bring them home and every treasure should be ours for our sacred altar or something. But I, I learned many years ago that that actually doesn't really resonate with me. And I learned to leave things. But then I was like, well, what if you're drawn to something you know, how do you make the choice? And so I made this rule around the rocks where I was like, okay, well, if the rock is poised atop the ground, oh, maybe I can take it. <laughs> you got to make rules. You got to make up rules. I love rules. And then I love to break them. <laughs> uh, here's, a, here's a poem about rules. Uh, it's called Visitors. Here's the rule. Don't come visit. But I've never been good at saying no. When you all arrive from the city, I become the apprentice. I learn from you because there's no better way to be friends. I'm not alone when I need to be, so I embrace the gift of wisdom that each of you brings. If I show my teeth, just remember, I came all the way out here to be the bear. I must love you with ferocity because I answered the phone. I said, yes, come into my sacred den. There are a few of my fine friends who got to come visit me in the desert. <laughs> uh, that poem is like a little pat on the back for you. <laughs> uh, this one's called Burr, like B-U-R. Pick the burr from the cat's paw, from the dog's paw, from between my own toes. Dig the burr out from the horse's hoof, from the tire tread, from the sole of my boot. I'm entranced by the spiked spiral shape well-tuned for its mission to travel, able to marry anything it touches. The screen door, my braid, my flannel shirt, the cactus spike, the rabbit pelt, even the wind. The Great Command. The great command holds my attention at various points throughout the day and night. Keep on living, keep on living, keep on living. 
I can hear a voice ask me, what abilities can I manage? Of what am I able? I respond with whatever I can muster. I follow up my ideas with infinite thanks. What else is there in the face of such mystery other than continuous celebration? I'm just happy to be anything at all. I say yes without fault, for nothing could be too wrong. Everything is as it should be. How could it not be? The quartz vein. Watch me as I spend myself bounding rock to rock, granite grinding soles, sheer edges ignored as we move toward the ravine. Here to rest in the quartz vein counting visitors, ravens, bees, and the lone flicker flying to prove the color red against such bright blue. Sitting still in the gut of cool stone, we let future visions come to us under the shadow of 49 woolly palm trees. Clutch my hip and say the word bone. Listen to my song and ask to marry my voice. At home, we dig a hollow in the sand for fire. Every star is in attendance and Venus is on the rise. We take off our clothes and skirt the tireless coals, anointed by unbound ash. I haven't read that poem out loud in a while. I like this poem. Actually, it's a good example of, I, I mixed like three different life experiences into that. There are like three different people and places all tied together there. That's a, an example of a poem that has had so many iterations. It's probably been edited like 20 times. Um, it's an old poem. I love that. Out here. That's the name of this next one, out here. I'm covered in horsehair and Bermuda grass. I spent the afternoon on the veranda, half of my body in the sun, reading a letter from a friend who says she's in love with an oyster. The planes overhead make tricks of sound, causing me to rise and check my phone. Someone might be calling with an opportunity, inspiration to spare, a story of a mollusk soulmate, or some wisdom to impart on my steady day. Someone might need advice or the affirmation that yes, I'm still alive out here. Turning compost, splitting wood, looking up names of desert scrub, and mainly asking myself how I feel. Without distraction, I can peer into my depths. I can ball and roll around on the ground without needing to know my reason. I squeeze the cat's dusty paw, I try and make out the words spoken by wind. Mm, I, I really love this poem. It's called On Seeing Love. As I close my eyes, lying in front of the wood stove, I think of love and see a deer. It stares at me and wants me to follow it into the void, but I can't keep my mind clear enough to let it be the guide. It turns back to swallow me. And then I see a tiger. It also opens its mouth to eat me whole. Animal after animal tries to take the lead, but I can't obey. And so I'm devoured again and again and again. When the fire dies down, I open my eyes. The cats flank me and the moths swarm the candle. I don't need to assign the weight of romance to my visions. If I were actually standing in the dark forest and a deer ushered me into the unknown, I'd let it. Uh, earthquakes. I sit at my desk writing a letter to a friend about the longevity of our love and the house starts moving from side to side. The cat stares directly in my eyes and I put my hand on the wall. The earth can turn everything into a wave if it wants to. Days later, I sit on a hill in the yard, writing in my journal. I like to situate myself in the warm sand, no blanket or chair. My skin is touching the ground as it begins to tremble again. It's as if the planet is trying to shake me from its fur, as if I'm on a boat in a sudden storm, Land becomes a ripple, 
not a solid thing to carry me onward. I get many calls. Am I safe? Am I afraid? I'm thrilled. I'd like to see the desert break open, swallow me in a crack alongside black beetles and ant lions. The cat stared at me the second time. From all the way across the yard, he kept his gaze on mine. His alarm was instinctual, but calm. Maybe that animal sense of mine has left. Maybe I'm just as tired as the earth. New Year's Eve, 2013. You made a coconut cream pie and let us cut it before it set. I wove, I, I wove a sculpture out of sticks at the center of the fire pit, meant for a midnight lighting. You went out there and dropped a match in without asking. We performed in the sand under the stars, splayed out beside the flames and sang into the dark. No one complained. No one got hurt. We danced in the kitchen when the wind came up. In the morning, we ran through the empty olive orchard in our boots, cowboy hats, and underwear. Everything felt new, and we were all still alive. I'm just seeing which ones, you know, I, like I said, it's hard for me to... It's hard for me to choose which ones to read. Okay, I'm gonna read this one. It's a little bit longer, but ooh, I love this poem. Like I said, this book, I don't know. I, I think it's interesting to write a trilogy because you get to watch yourself progress as a writer as you're creating a trilogy. <laughs> so the third book, I don't know if it's always better, but it's just my writing absolutely improved throughout the process of creating the trilogy. So it's interesting. But I also think that the desert just is the place where the desert and humble are they're, they're the two places where I've just poured out the most of my work. Um, this one's called No Creature Ever Feels Safe. Every creature is always on guard, connected to the will to live. I'm held by my love of earth. I can feel our orbit. I sense the actual spinning motion. I'm embraced by an ancient grandmother spirit and by the light of desert rose cradling my head. Even so, I find myself afraid. I'm lying in the wash, pretending to be the snake, belly and brow on the warm sand. What is it that I fear? Not death, not the snake. I am afraid of men. I am afraid a man will find me. I am a woman alone in the desert. I turn over. This seems wrong. I have my knife and I can see for miles in every direction. I love being alone in the desert. A flock of fighter jets soars over me. The bombs start dropping out at the military base and the ground shakes. I start crying because I see where the fear comes from. And instead of it being irrational, and instead of it being irrational, it's reasonable and loud. Two hawks appear to do a swirling dance. The moon is full. I see Datura close by. When it's dark, I realize I need to release something old from the left side of my neck. I'm no longer just a small animal. I see myself as a warrior throughout all of time. Various types of armor, once with a baby tucked under one arm, once with my hair in a knot high atop my head, solitary and determined carrying a sword. This is also when I first see the dead rat in my neck. Is it really dead? I can't tell, but I know it means something and it's time for a ritual. I make three small tombs to bury a bullet shell, a piece of tar roofing and a nail. The grandmother spirit speaks through a spindly chaparral. No creature ever feels safe. The tortoise in its burrow Cottontail in its den, mockingbird asleep in the yucca, I always with one eye open, death imminent, and safety is a ruse that lasts but a moment. We all nearly get washed away in the yearly storms. Some of us perish, some of us root deep enough to hold on. The darkness wants you to forget how many times you've survived it all. 
that you're an animal with sharp teeth too. I'll do what I can. I'll find a way to wake up the rat. All right, I'll read a few more. To trust our relentless star. First light has me rise and watch the sky. It makes the mountains undulate with shades of amber and purple. The cup of fire spills itself in the shape of a circle and I wait each day for its return. We destroyed the protective shield and now our bodies can't handle this much glow. But we didn't know the shield existed. The seers knew, the ancient spirits and guiding prophets knew. The sun has come for its vengeance. I hum to greet it, coyote sings, then I sleep again and dream of all my friends. Too many people in my head, too many people on the planet. What will come of our remaining years on earth? We may watch this heat burn us up. I may sit, cross-legged, hovering in space as the whole planet dissolves into flame again. However it goes, the end will happen, and I do not hate the sun. Hmm. The Locksmith he arrived with a truck full of keys, all shapes and sizes, one of which would unlock my sense of self, returning me to wholeness. But, oh, what a task. So many to choose from, and I don't want to miss the sunset. He laughed and patted the bench seat, worn and sandy. I looked at his hands, so rough with work, and thought perhaps he was the key himself. Ma'am, I'm a messenger. I'm made of magic, and I can't be married. Well, doesn't love drive a truck? Doesn't love offer the greatest opening? I sifted through the collection and found one that fit into my palm. He nodded and touched my knee with approval. No charge. And he drove off just in time for me to walk out into the wash, the last gasp of sun spilling itself onto the desert, everything golden and brown, everything quiet, and no one else around. Okay, I gotta figure out which ones are left to read. The center of nothing. It's a warm night and I decide to sleep outside after checking the bed for scorpions. The stars are a sheet of white, and darkness appears only as thin threads between the glow. I take some deep breaths as coyotes sing a few miles away. I ask the sky, what will we become after so much waste and greed? The answer reverberates in my skull. You will soon all be weightless, without ground like ears of corn floating in space. Without well-loved land, you won't eat. You'll be outlines of air. A black hole speaks in each human eye. You're the center of nothing, little pencil lines in an equation of chance. Three shooting stars end the discussion, and I smile before dreaming. I've cried so much already. All right. So hard for me to not want to read all these. Ooh, I got to read this one. Okay, I'll read. I'll read two or three more, and then maybe I'll have there'll be someone who will want to ask some questions. Uh, our story is a daydream. I got a story brewing for us: a fantasy of country living, clothes on the line, your sister's kids hanging on your back and in my arms. I might be in a floral cotton dress or athletic shorts and cowboy boots, maybe pregnant, maybe just helping you cut down a dead tree. You watch me ride a horse and make a moan that no one else can hear. 
but when I dismount, you meet me in the kitchen and take me as if I were the very first woman to be known by hands like yours. Some days we drive out into the field to see the fox, and you park your red truck on the small ridge so we can nap in the grass. We get ticks. Every once in a while, we drink too much, but the music is good, and whenever we fight, it's existential, so it's always fun. You marry me because you can't help yourself, and I'm not really yours. We both go on trips alone to ramble for the sake of our spirits, but there's no one I'd rather be with than you. When you walk into a room, I shake my head in appreciation. It's not because you're perfect or evolved beyond any comparison. It's because you're dedicated to the character you've made of yourself. You've let that man expand across the United States on almost every road, and he knows, without a doubt, there's no one out there better than me. With my sage burning, with my collection of plants and stones, with my ability to be soft and gentle, rough and sure, I'm the one who makes you bow your head. I want you to be the leader, but I always know the way. We both understand that I'm a cosmic goddess with every answer embedded in my small and healthy body. Hopefully, we'll die together, but we know that no matter what, our lives will be interesting. You met me pulling weeds, and I saw even then you were a tempting tangle of darkness. But your heart is pure, and I'm meant to hold it while you hold mine. Even if the whole thing is a story I made up based on a feeling, it's all a story anyway. So why not make it the best one? All right. Desert details. The yellow buds of the chaparral, the wind bending the creosote bush, two names for the same plant. The raven circling overhead, the crow staying close to town, two dark birds so different. The black widow on the windowsill, the hummingbird that hit the window pane, two bodies to mark a seemingly barren view. The brown butterfly grasping the dead Joshua tree, the pistachio shells circling its hollowed trunk, two signs to prove that life remains. I don't think I've ever read this one out loud. Maybe I have, but I feel like it right now. The Walls Within. The flooded roads and thick, black, beautiful mud. I know I don't have a homeland. I don't belong to a family, but the planet is full of living things. I recall the dead dog in the plastic bag and the smell of death. That was our last time in the desert. I had never seen the sky like that, a solid blur of white. I was closed to your touch, but let you in. I carried a pink brick around for months and gave it to you for your birthday. But you come from a family of artists, not builders. My walls extend from a wound. They're buried so deep that they seem inflexible and don't feel like a choice. But I've learned the difference. A boundary can bend. All right, I'll read. Well, good thing I made some marks for myself. All right, I'll read three more. And that'll be that. Um, I see somebody asked a question. Were you always confident about your work and publishing and sharing it? Um, I will answer that when I'm done reading. I don't want to lose it in the thing, so. The center of the planet is a star. I write down all of my animal encounters in a handmade journal. I hike to the oasis, go to bed early, wake up early, light a fire in the wood stove. I bring more color into my body. I say the name of the sky over and over. I see the black feather on the bench, the pumpkin-sized cloud the fish scale in the sand, and the milkweed seed caught in my sweater since last summer. 
Every morning I envision the roots of myself traveling down into the earth. I remember the center of the planet is a star. I am not afraid to love it. All right, two more. Dancing with the dead you. I smell your shirt and call you a fucking asshole. If your body were here, I know what it would be doing. So I dance the whole Waylon album with you. I can see you shaking and twirling, then sitting down on the couch to drink and smoke with your mouth turning down the way it did, so certain of yourself. Your consciousness is not alive in my brain because I'm just meat. But beyond the matter, there is something, a replica of your joy, a ghost of your greatness. In the desert, you get to be alive still because it's quiet enough and no one will interrupt me or tell me you're gone. I cry for one second and you remind me that now I get to hold on to the version of you that's painless. I won't have to drag you into your bed. I won't have to ask you to quit it with the whole bad boy show. And I won't have to love those parts of you that were so sad. You just get to be my shakedown freak partner now. With my eyes closed, I see you laughing as the black mass of space, dark ooze that rolls and surges freely between stars. <sighs> All right, one more. California doesn't belong to me. We're not supposed to be here. Who sees a barren world will plant and cultivate will complicate the landscape. We did that, and now the coyote circles the fence and waits for the house cat. Rattlesnakes get caught in the plastic tree shades. The birds sip from the leaking hose, and I know I'm not allowed to feed the desert tortoise my strawberries, but the whole system is broken anyhow. Everything is stolen from a lineage of people who knew how to live with this land, who nurtured the collaboration with Western Earth, who tended rivers and exchanged effort with animals, who filled baskets with just enough and never too much. California doesn't belong to me. Its human bond was cracked long before my atoms came together in this form, long before the frontier became a seed of longing in greedy hearts. Now everything I love is just a ghost of what could have been. Now everything I wish to protect is a reminder of a story once shared in song, the greatness of the coast cherished by those who, who rightfully wed the edge. <sighs>